because of the absolute scale of the epidemic and the burden that we're facing, we have come to the realization that our models for replication and scale up on a human scale are absolutely impossible and we can't do it. Well, one of the things we say at PopTech is that if you have a choice between a great entrepreneur with a mediocre business plan or a mediocre plan with a really great entrepreneur, always take the great person. It's not going to happen because we're at that moment where we need something that's going to take it a step beyond what we're able to do as human beings because we cannot reach out. Zinni can't train enough. She can't be in enough schools, communities with enough traditional leaders to make this happen. And fortunately, with Krista and Zinni, we didn't actually have to make that choice at all because these are two true warriors of change. They are on the very front lines of the HIV crisis, working in one of the most resource-constrained settings in the world but their level of innovation should be the envy of every corporation on earth. I met Zinni at a hospice in Durban and I was going there bringing some food to a hospice support group and when I arrived the whole group were some of them in wheelchairs, some of them in stretchers, others sitting in chairs and there was this very thin woman in the back seat singing like an angel. It is worldwide known that South Africa is ground zero for the AIDS epidemic. The hospital where I teach functions from, which is a public hospital, it can be grim as it can get. In KwaZulu-Natal, the infection rate is over 30%. This means when you're walking down the street, when you're driving down the road in KwaZulu-Natal, every third person is HIV positive. That's negative, negative, positive, negative, negative, positive. We have 1,500 nurses trained that join the workforce here in the public health sector every year. 1,500. 2,000 nurses die from AIDS every year. HIV testing is available every place in the country, in every province, in every district, in every clinic, in every hospital, for free. And patients and communities are extremely well informed where they can access that service. If testing is free, why aren't people testing? If ARVs are free, why are people not accessing those? And the answer is simple and not simple. People don't know their status because they don't want to access the service as it currently exists. They don't want to go to their local clinic where their aunt or cousin is in charge of the clinic. They don't want to go to a clinic where their neighbors are in line and queuing for the service. So their status is then disclosed to others. In this part of the world and in this country, the politics of HIV are enormously complicated. You have bad information, misinformation, disinformation. There are alternative healthcare systems that aren't perfectly aligned with each other all the time. Um, and in the midst of that, you have tremendous issues of stigma. Stigma has been and continues to be the biggest hurdle. I think the stigma in South Africa is not different than it is in other places in the world. HIV has a unique aura around it. And because the disease initially affected people who were already disenfranchised, the, the stigma became even worse. All the things we saw in the media were all negative, were all depressing, were all... It was just a negative connotation around HIV, and therefore it, it drove people away from wanting to know the fact about HIV or to addressing the particular problem. So what happens is people come to test only because of personal crisis, because they themselves have become extremely ill. So. If the goal is to figure out how to get people to get tested earlier, then you have to figure out how to deal with all the stigma issues. But people had the solution in their pocket. They were carrying around a communications device that we never used before. Uh, that combination completely routes around the stigma issue. It routes around all of the communications uh, quandaries and delivers the right information to the right person at the right time. The, the big idea was looking at the role that mobile services and support can play throughout the process. And it kind of lit up like a constellation. We met two potential partners in Johannesburg, and that meeting was one of those visceral aha moments, like, aha. Well, imagine if you've got 
every single person in Africa, even the poorest people, with a mobile phone in their hand, and you can communicate with them at a drop of a hat, at a push of a button, you can send a message out, and imagine that they can respond to that message, and you can capture the cell phone number of that person who comes back to you, and imagine you can track each and every single interaction you have with that person, then what type of service can't you run? In this part of the world, it turns out that about 90% of the cell phone contracts are prepaid contracts. That is, people pay before they make a call, not after. So they created a special kind of text message so that if I'm out of minutes and I want someone else to call me, I can send them uh, an empty text message called a please call me. So 30 million of them are going out. The SMS um, has got 160 characters in it, and the first um, 40 characters or so are used for that please call me, and the rest is completely empty. Um, so we've got all this empty space, and we thought, well, there's 30 million of those going around with no um, content in them. We can go and insert a message in there, and that's the, the please call me social impact message. A local language HIV and TB related message with one button access to the National HIV call centers. And then with Precal and iTeach in hand, we then went to MTN and we were able to negotiate for 5% of all the traffic in the country, um, which makes this the largest use of mobile phones for the delivery of healthcare information ever undertaken. No size, but my syringes. My syringes, as a size, I'm a fan. In terms of a South African crisis, you, you, you can't scale nurses, you can't scale doctors. But in terms of using mobile devices, interventions go to people. You know, it was clear to me that we were onto something very interesting. Uh, didn't know yet all the ways we were going to implement it, you know, what it would take to implement it, you know, the money, the other resources. But, you know, there was clearly a sense of promise and there was clearly, you know, we can accomplish something here in that sense. That's why you will find that some patients will actually sleep on the bank waiting just to appear sleeping on the bed. So the critical, more critical patients will be actually put in here, those that need drugs put up will be here. To me, the, the more interesting and new frontier your partners are, the, the more intriguing and cutting edge your project will be. I didn't think it needed design people. I didn't think it needed technology. I never thought, certainly never crossed my mind to think about a business model to save people's lives. You have to know, are you going to be able to communicate together? Are you going to be able to share ideas and feed off each other's thinking? Are you going to understand each other's viewpoint? You know, and those are things you figure out early on, you know, and meeting Christian Zinni was a real revelation in their desire to engage in that kind of dialogue. People gave us guidance and pointers and connections and, and helped us find exactly the right people. And they came from every level. I mean, the, the number one hip hop label in South Africa, um, Ghetto Rough, uh, is run by these visionary people. And the musicians themselves had incredibly important things to say. What we're gonna do, we musicians, so we felt we can spread the message through our music, but we needed to see what is going on before we preach it to other people. I mean, in terms of the reality of HIV. Now, there was this boy that was laying there, and he was very young, and I couldn't take I really couldn't. Our first project, which we are announcing today, builds on a relationship that we started at PopTech last year. If we have a belief system at PopTech, one of our core beliefs is that the most important gap in the world is the gap between what most of us think we're capable of achieving and what we're actually capable of achieving. I think by definition, we all need to discover a sense of possibility as we look out into the future beyond this. And it's going to include a lot of things like Project M. Amplifying the impact of good ideas with technology and fostering a really deep collaboration between very different kinds of people uh, is what can take a great idea and turn it into an even better reality. <laughs> Oh, <laughs>